attention, duped masses! You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Fake film crews, stalled negotiations, and playing albums backwards. Plus, this day in history with Aaliyah Killed and our song of the day by Beck on Your Morning Monarchy for August 25th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. Welcome to wherever you are. Good morning to Friday. Thank you so much for listening and joining us here. MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. Streaming live Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. Independent news, music, and more brought to you by you. Huge thanks to all our supporters at MediaMonarchy.com slash support. That's right, it is Friday. That's when we look at the entertainment industrial complex. We call it hashtag media memes and all the stories that we're going to talk about we tweet out about an hour before showtime so if you're listening live and you got a fondle slab handy handy <laughs> you can follow along i appreciate you following along yes we are still having some feed gremlins now in the meantime i've been putting up every episode on youtube you might be missing out on your song of the day in the case of things like beck or robert plant indie stuff we can get away with but the big boys we got to cut the songs out before we upload them to youtube Figuring out problems with the code, I mentioned yesterday, I'm discovering old ancient remnants of code that go back to the Blogspot days and the Pirate Radio days. So all those little gremlin bits of code are hanging out and I just need to dive in and get into it and probably going to spend the better part of my weekend working on all of that. It seems in some ways to be a lot of iTunes issues. So again, I would just mostly recommend go to the website, right click on download mp3, save file as, and you should have it. If that doesn't work for you, you got way bigger problems than I can fix for you. (laughs) Oh, computers. Glad you're here. Again, I'm James Evan Plato from MediaMonarchy.com. It is Media Memes Day. Let's glance at the breaking lamestream news before we dive in to all the entertainment industrial complex news. And again, huge thanks to the Truth Seeker app for carrying your morning monarchy and RadioConfluence.com for not only rebroadcasting and carrying your Media Monarchy shows, but they simulcast it. They do it live. That's huge thanks to Jared and the RadioConfluence.com community. Hurricane Harvey churns towards Texas coastline. I know we have more than a couple listeners down in that area. I hope they're in the safety zone. I know we got that gorilla and Apollo Slater and Booze Leprechaun, who actually made the joke that they were just going to download a bunch of extra Media Monarchy episodes in case their power goes out. Which, you know, that's good advice. I love hearing from people sometimes that say, oh, I downloaded like a day's worth of Pump Up the Volumes and listened to them on a 24-hour train ride. I feel like I know you. You kind of do. Fairly honest and authentic here on the show. At least I try my best to be. I know somebody who's very happy their last name won't be in the news anymore related to President Trump. Gary Cohn, Trump's advisor, said to have drafted resignation letter after Charlottesville. Now, have we actually seen, is Gary Cohn resigning? He's distressed. Trump's economic advisor says president must do better. So I don't know that I've actually seen anything that says Gary Cohn has quit, but they say he's probably getting ready to. As again, it's hard to keep anything secret. They usually know who's going to quit. They always know what the speeches are going to be. There's very little in surprise. Remember, politics is show business for ugly people. Trump slams another Republican senator warning Bob Corker that Tennessee not happy. And the guru of bling rape conviction sparks deadly protests in India. That's a story we would talk about on our Thursday edition. I already kind of bookmarked that. We might go into that a little bit later this week. Samsung leader J.Y. Lee given five-year sentence for bribery as the strange story in South Korea continues to have this sort of bizarro parallel world to our own machinations in America's next top president chicanery here in the States. Mnuchin viewed eclipse from the roof of Fort Knox. As America loves to get mad at Mnuchin. Now, the other hilarious part that I don't actually have on my stack today, it would be a media memes thing. Rapper Joey Badass tweeted all night on Monday about how I looked at the eclipse. There's no big deal. I'm sure, I'm pretty sure our ancestors looked at the eclipse and they didn't all go blind. And then the next day, Joey Badass announces all his concerts are canceled because he's a big dumbass who stared at the eclipse. <laughs> oh, simple, simple yucks, but you got to get him for where you can. And of course, I got to give you your fact check. Counter protesters paid in Charlottesville. That's from factcheck.org. Pants on fire. Paul Ryan uses old stat to claim counties will have no Obamacare insurer in 2018. That's from PolitiFact. Did Congress designate Confederate soldiers as United States veterans? That's from Snopes. Catherine McPhee, not Jane Doe, in nude photo lawsuit, despite report. That's from Gossip Cop. And Trump claims that he himself created one million jobs as president. That's from the Washington Compost. Those are all your fact checks. Very important. 
Ooh, in other news, Tesla appears to be preparing a streaming music service called the cleverly titled T-Tunes. Nice job. Well, you, you haven't launched it yet. You've, you've still got time to work on that name. One of the other bits I see floating around in the news right there on your breaking lamestream news is the way we will begin this episode as the legendary Village Voice ends a print run that lasted 60 years. The Village Voice, the alternative weekly newspaper co-founded by Norman Mailer and known for its cultural coverage and investigative reporting, said on Tuesday it will end its print version and continue as an online-only publication. Peter Barbie, who has purchased the newspaper in 2015, said in a statement the move is part of the media's migration to the internet. He also said that its readers now expect, quote, a range of media from words and pictures to podcasts, video, and even other forms of print publishing. The Voice was started by Mailer, the Pulitzer Prize winning author, and three others in New York's Greenwich Village in 1955. You, you guys, your, your music bed's way too loud. I've told you, I supply the music bed here at Media Monarchy, and that's how we begin. Village Voice ends a 60-year print run. I see in the chat there will be no tears shed, and it's probably, you know, I'm the one who's sad that Sears might go out of business and maybe shed a tear for the Village Voice. Now, I'm also an East Coast boy, so I had the chance to read the Village Voice a bit. It's only the... It's really, at this point, the only logical move. And maybe in some ways, once you lose everything, you're free to do anything. And now maybe the Village Voice will turn into good news online. That remains to be seen, but let's give some some props where props is due as we hop over to Muckrock. Thanks to the CIA, you can read the report the CIA doesn't want you to read. On February 16, 1976, the Village Voice went to press with an emblazoned the report on the CIA that President Ford doesn't want you to read. Inside was a leaked copy of the findings of the Pike Committee, a lesser known and arguably more damning companion to the Church Committee. Text highlights from the suppressed House Intelligence Committee report. Washington was furious. Kissinger called the leaks a new version of McCarthyism. They've got a Washington Post article from February 13, 1976. Kissinger hits leaks of Pike report. Representative Robert McClory, Republican of Indiana, took to the House floor to condemn the report appearing in an anti-establishment New York tabloid. Mr. McClory asked and was given permission to address the House for one minute. Mr. Speaker, it must have shocked every member of this House to learn that what purports to be an official House document should appear in an anti-establishment New York tabloid called the Village Voice. And even the committee's chairman and namesake, Otis G. Pike, Democrat in New York, feared that the leak was a CIA plot to make the committee look bad. Chairman Otis G. Pike, this coming from, again, the Washington Post. All these bits embedded on muckrock, which is one of the best parts they do. It is your source for FOIA documents with a really easy interface. Chairman Otis G. Pike said yesterday he had no idea who leaked parts of the report of his House Intelligence Committee to the Village Voice, but suggested that the leak would serve the interests of the Central Intelligence Agency. Yes, sometimes media outlets, mainstream and alternative alike, can be used as intelligence cutouts. Cutout meaning you're being used, but you don't necessarily know it. Journalist Daniel Shore later came forward as the leaker, explaining that he felt he could could not be the one responsible for suppressing the report. Shore refused to name his source and narrowly avoided jail time. Thanks to the agency's obsessive, obsessive scrapbooking, you can read the full issue of the report you weren't supposed to read scanned into their declassified ar uh, archives. And it's all embedded below. The CIA report the president doesn't want you to read. Which is hilarious. The joke here being that now you can read all of these photocopied bits because the CIA photocopied all of it. I guess the Village Voice doesn't have all that up online. Now I can also glance at the chat and see while most of your ad, when most of your ad revenue comes from porn. In the age of the web, selling porn ads in a newspaper only makes sense if you use it to clean up after yourself. Hey, guess what? Your morning monarchy is always for adults only. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. Blasting out your morning monarchy. Media Memes Edition, as we're paying some respect to the Village Voice. That's the strange world we live in. You don't necessarily have to take or leave any media outlets. You're able to use them, glean what you can, get what's good, and get rid of the rest. 
I don't think we have it on the record because it probably transpired while we were taking a little bit of time off, but you know, I'm OCD and like to put everything in the show notes, get everything on the record, so that when future generations and civilizations listen to these episodes, they'll go, oh, that, that was when Bannon quit or got fired. Former White House advisor is executive chairman of Breitbart News again and chaired the outlet's editorial meeting last Friday. The president, after a few weeks of voicing displeasure that Steve Bannon was getting too much credit for his successes and not enough blame for failures, ousted his chief advisor last Friday, allowing the freewheeling media entrepreneur a whole lot of time to pursue his passion that would be making and breaking political careers on Breitbart. He'll do so from his perch at Breitbart News, where he returned as executive chairman. Long before Trump's candidacy was a thing, Bannon was working at the margins producing films attacking Hillary Clinton, defending Sarah Palin, and boosting the legacy of Ronald Reagan. They were effective pieces of evangelism, but they only spoke to the choir. When he joined the campaign as CEO and helped him to victory, he proved beyond doubt his ability to craft narratives and change hearts and minds. Now he's free to work his magic against his former boss, should he choose to, which is what some insiders expect will now be the case that he's returned to Breitbart. So we'll see what happens there, and that's from The Hollywood Reporter. Steve Bannon returns to Breitbart. Trump presidency that we fought for and won is over. And the crowd goes wild. Now, diving down further into the muck, if you will, of media memes... The Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press filed a lawsuit Monday against the Justice Department and FBI in an effort to pry loose documents related to the FBI's prior impersonation of documentary filmmakers. The FBI has admitted to sending undercover agents to Nevada in 2014 to act as a film crew and interview supporters of rancher Clive and Bundy. Amid an armed standoff with the federal government, footage shot for the fake documentary was later used by the government during criminal trials of some of those involved in the standoff. The reporters' committee sought through, again, the aforementioned Freedom of Information Act request to obtain FBI records regarding the bogus film crew as well as any records on the Bureau's use of the tactic dating back to 2010. The lawsuit filed Monday in the U.S. District Court for the District of Criminals comes after the committee said the FBI has failed to act on the FOIA request. FBI agents pretended to work for a bogus film company, Longbow Productions, to gain access to and interview Mr. Bundy and others who aided him during the standoff. The agents created a website, business cards, and other credentials to make Longbow Productions look like an authentic company. The FBI's impersonation of journalists and documentary filmmakers undermines the credibility and independence of those who are trying to report on matters of importance to the public, said Katie Townsend, litigation director for the committee. The public deserves to know more about the FBI's use of this tactic and has a right to this information under the law. But the FBI seems determined to evade disclosure. We're asking the court to step in and compel the agency to release these records. The trial of four men accused of criminal charges stemming from the 2014 standoff with the Bureau of Land Management ended this year in a hung jury. Video shot by the FBI as part of the bogus documentary was used in their trial. A retrial got underway for the four men in July, and a jury is deliberating in the case. Eighteen defendants, including Bundy and his sons Ammon and Ryan, are scheduled to be tried in a series of three tiers on more than a dozen other counts based on their involvement in the April 2014 standoff. So, Washington Times reported just the other day a retrial got underway for the four men in July, and a four men... I don't want to confuse you talking about legal terms and say foreman. A retrial got underway for the four, one, two, three, four men in July, and a jury is deliberating the case. However, since I live up here in Oregon, I knew it very quickly this week. No guilty verdicts in Bundy Ranch standoff trial. The update for you. Federal jury in Las Vegas actually declined to convict four men of any crimes for their participation in the 2014 armed standoff near the Bundy Ranch in Bunkerville, Nevada. During that conflict, ranchers and militia members blocked federal officers from confiscating livestock owned by the Nevada cattlemen, Clive and Bundy. On Tuesday, jurors acquitted the defendants Richard R. Loveline and Stephen A. Stewart of all charges and O. Scott Drexler and Eric J. Parker on most counts against them. No guilty verdicts. And you are listening to The Morning Monarchy as America slowly loses its mind. ESPN broadcaster Robert Lee will not work Virginia's season opener, or rather he didn't. I believe it was this past weekend. It's all because of Char Charlottesville. 
ESPN broadcaster Robert Lee will not work Virginia's season opener because of recent violence in Charlottesville sparked by the decision to remove a statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee. A spokeswoman for ESPN says Lee has been moved to Youngtown's, Youngstown State's game at Pittsburgh on the ACC Network on September 2nd. He, he got moved to the, to, the, to the boonies. He got moved to the ghetto show. He got downshifted to the minor leagues. <laughs> a spokeswoman for ESPN says Lee has been moved to Youngstown State. The network says the decision was made as the tragic events in Charlottesville were unfolding simply because of the coincidence of his name. Plans to remove a statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee led to a protest in Charlottesville earlier this month that attracted what is believed to be the largest group of white nationalists to come together in a decade. Violent clashes erupted between two seemingly opposing armies of idiots, white nationalists and so-called anti-fascists. ESPN said the decision to pull put Lee on another game was made collectively and also says it's a shame that this is even a topic of conversation. It is a shame because there's a lot of things that people... Hey, this thing I didn't know about, I just heard about, and I'm really mad, and I'm going to go off in some sort of knee-jerk fashion. Like the folks here in Oregon who want to change the name of the Lynch School. Because, you know, it says Lynch, even though it's a fa family name. So that's the question. And Reason is asking it. Why are media outlets giving commentary space to wannabe censors? This week, the Washington Compost joins several other large corrupt media outlets in giving commentary space to an academic who thinks the First Amendment maybe shouldn't protect so much free speech. I'll give Jennifer Delton, Skidmore College's Douglas Family Chair in American Culture, History, and Literary and Interdisciplinary Studies this much. She's not disguising her calls for censorship of conservative opinion by claiming this will achieve some sort of racial enlightenment or equality. She openly describes this censorship as a tool for stopping the spread of political arguments she sees as dangerous. Her example is the purge of Communist Party members from unions, the civil service, and academia in the middle of the 20th century because they were a threat to the established liberal control of the Democratic Party. The argument was that these communists did not actually believe in free speech, probably true, and were using it as a shield to protect them while they attempt to undermine democracy. She sees similar tactics in the alt-right, which Delton says is using speech as a weapon to attack liberal values in college, colleges. She says, quote, It is true that higher education has brought much of this on itself through the extreme policing of speech and tolerance of student protesters who shut down speakers with whom they disagree. But that doesn't diminish the extent to which the alt-right and conservatives are using free speech to attack and destroy college universities, which have long promoted different variations of the internationalist, secular, cosmopolitan, multicultural liberalism that marks the thinking of educated elites of both parties. Hilariously, she ends her commentary by saying the process of depriving these bad people of their First Amendment freedoms should not be used to censor liberal critics of college or government behavior. Only wrong people should be censored. The title of this op-ed, by the way, is When Free Speech Becomes a Political Weapon. Now, you may have ran out of this. Writers aren't typically responsible for their headlines. But her op-ed does describe speech as a weapon. The title reflects it accurately. So it's worth wondering whether Delton even grasps that she wants censorship to be a political weapon. They want to use the government to shut down speech that undermines the institutions that they value. It's almost as though they understand the actual underpinnings of Supreme Court cases that brought us the tiresome fire in a crowded theater trope. A case that revolved around the prosecution of anti-war protests and still supports the ruling. Any authority to shut down speech will be turned towards the press eventually. So again, that's the question. Rather rhetorical. Why are media outlets giving commentary space to wannabe censors? That would be because most of your giant corporate media outlets are either owned part and parcel or are thoroughly in the pocket of the aforementioned intelligence agencies, the CIA being the most well-known. You ever heard of Operation Mockingbird? Washington Post has been well in the pocket of the Central Intelligence Agency for decades, decades, decades. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy for Friday, August 25th, 2017. I am James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com, giving you a fear-free look at what's really going on in the world. I ain't got no snake oil to sell you. I don't have a bullhorn. I won't try and freak you out or start to tell you something that you got to tune in next week to learn the rest. We're true, legitimate, independent alt media, and I'm glad you're here. 
police in Rotterdam in the Netherlands canceled a concert by California psych rock band A La La's in connection with a terror threat. Concert venue Masilo wrote on Twitter, which I cannot read. Translation essentially says from the cops, police took this information seriously enough that after discussion with organizers, it was decided to cancel the event. So this is basically rock bands gets their, gets their show canceled in the Netherlands because of some vague terror threat. The cancellation was announced shortly before the show was set to begin. Authorities also said they found a van containing glass bottles near the venue, according to the AP in the Brussels-based newspaper De Morgan. Photos on social media show officers and police vans outside Masilo, which operates in a converted grain silo. In the wake of the scare, the Associated Press and other outlets have drawn attention to Alala's band name, which incorporates the Arabic word for God. The band spells their name Allah, A-L-L-A-H, dash, La, L-A-S, Alala's. The band chose the name because they wanted something holy sounding. They told The Guardian last year. They said they get emails from Muslims here in the U.S. and around the world saying they're offended. But that absolutely wasn't our intention, says singer Miles Michaud. We email back and explain why we chose the name, and mainly they understand. The Alalas formed in Los Angeles in 2008. They're currently on a short European tour. They also announced Covers No. 1, the first in a series of cover song EPs for Mexican Summer Records. The update to this story, Alalas released a statement following the events in Rotterdam. Due to a potential terror threat at the Masilo in Rotterdam, the Alala show was canceled tonight. Details are not available at this time as the incident is still in under investigation. The band is under, un, unharmed and are very grateful to the Rotterdam police and other responsible agencies for detecting the potential threat before anyone was hurt. We are unable to comment any further at this time. Now, we've been playing Alala's a long time here on Media Monarchy, and if you dig back in the archives, we've got probably a few years worth of songs we played from the A La La's. Now, currently, we do have one of their latest songs in rotation. It's this instrumental. If you've been listening to the Media Monarchy stream Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 Pacific time, we've got news and music. Hereafter, this is the latest instrumental 7-inch from A La La's. So we've been playing that for a bit. Really interesting, really interesting if that was indeed related to their name. Or if it's just giant synchronistic coincidence meanwhile as we start to dive into the music news here got a lot of obituaries and a lot of other interesting news still to come in this episode mediamonarchy.com slash listen mystical remember the rapper he's been arrested and charged with first degree rape Police in Shreveport, Louisiana, put out a warrant for his arrest last week, and the rapper turned himself in, actually, to the Cato Parish Sheriff's Department. According to TMZ, Mystical and another man are being charged with raping a woman at a casino where he was performing in 2016. A representative for Mystical says that the allegations are false and that he plans to plead not guilty. He's currently being held on a $2 million bond. In 2003, Mystical pled guilty to sexual battery and extortion and served six years in prison for forcing his hairstylist to perform sex acts on him and two bodyguards. Yes, the chat has it right. It's Mystical with a K. Was it back, back that ass up? Was that his big hit years and years ago? So you start to look this up, and I was even looking for some clips and things, but I didn't find any. What you'll basically find are articles and headlines and YouTube clips and tweets that say, Mystical arrested on rape again. Now, this story is from Stereo Gum and actually goes back to the 21st. I'd have a hard, hard time believing he's still sitting in jail. I imagine he could probably scrape together a $2 million bond. Hey, speaking of artists we're not really into... <laughs> And again, I don't want Media Monarchy, and we've kind of chatted about this in the chat a little bit. I don't ever want this to feel like, this is a list of things I used to be into, but that suck balls now. I want to be more positive, and hopefully you feel the positivity that comes through on Media Monarchy. I think a lot of it comes from my own disappointment in things, and i it's a problem I've had to work on all my life. Having a little too much hope and faith and belief in things that ultimately, of course, I end up getting disappointed when they don't live up to my expectations. However, 
I've never liked James Murphy or LCD Sound System. I find them incredibly overrated. They do have some good stuff. I did buy one of their records back in the day. I think DFA put out fantastic Electro 12 inches. Kind of wish he was just a label head. But no, 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 no. James Murphy is not just a label head. And we'll learn more from Stereo Gum, whose music coverage is essentially indistinguishable from Spin and the rest of them. But here's the story. LCD Sound Systems, and this is, you've heard me gripe about them in the past. My biggest complaint about them was they made this giant deal about breaking up and doing a big live concert, and then we're back together next year and signed to a major label. None of which on its own I have any problem with. It's just the giant show, and it seemed, it, you know, it kind of seemed like a hose job. LCD Sound System's final show at Madison Square Garden, or in any case, the band's final show for about five years, entered into the annals of New York rock legend almost as soon as it was announced. And James Murphy has talked before about how nobody expected his band to sell out the historic New York venue. In Lizzie Goodman's book, Meet Me in the Bathroom, he mentions how some business types suggested adding Big Boy of, of Outcast, also with a K, to the bill to make sure it sold, and now Murphy has gone on record saying that, it, at least in part, his decision to temporarily end the band was an attempt to sell out Madison Square Garden. In a New York Times profile, James Murphy talks about all his reasons for temporarily ending LCD Sound System. He didn't want to start sucking. He didn't like the idea of following a normal career progression. But a Madison Square Garden show, which had been booked far in advance, was also part of the reasoning. The venue didn't think we were going to sell well, Murph Murphy explains. Quote, my theory was, if I make it our last show, we'll sell it out in two weeks, he said. The show sold out in minutes. It wasn't a total lark, but it was a bit larky, Mr. Murphy admitted. But I like making decisions. I find it easy. In a new Vulture interview, Murphy tells a similar story. Quote, We had booked this Madison Square Garden show and then realized the show's promoters had no faith in us. They were trying to come up with big name openers for us because they didn't think we could sell out the place by ourselves. One of the openers they suggested was Big Boy from Outcast. Why on earth would Big Boy open for us? Big Boy was one of the biggest, most important hip hop. No, one of the biggest and most important acts of all time. It didn't make any sense. But behind that idea was the promoters' belief that we weren't just going to sell any tickets unless there was some extra element. So I got mad on the phone with him about it. I was like, well, how about it's our last fucking show? And I hung up the phone. Then I was like, I, I guess that'll be our last show then. When interviewer David Marchese tells Murphy that his story makes the decision sound cynical, Murphy responds, maybe it is. I mean, I don't know. I was just mad. He says he'll never announce a breakup of the band again. For the rest of my life, no matter what happens in the world, we'll never break up again. One day we'll just stop making music, but no one's going to say a fucking word about it ahead of time. A little update. Other LCD Sound System member Al Doyle took to Twitter to interpret Murphy's remarks, writing that the band didn't break up to grub ticket money. Sure sounds that's exactly like what you did to grub ticket money. So, just pretty gross. Pretty gross stuff. And I, again, like having my suspicions confirmed. Or they say it in the chat, James Murphy, whiny bitch. Morning Monarchy is for adults only, my friends. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. Do you remember the last time you were excited about a piece of mail? There is an interesting piece on Stereo Gum asking again the musical question, why are so many bands surprising fans with snail mail this year? And I think this speaks to the authenticity of what is real, and the complete plastic fakeness of everything else. Now, of course, when you're Taylor Swift, you can pretty much do anything, everything, all the time. Hey, have you heard? I think she has some new screeches that have been just released. She sent some things out to fans as a big surprise. And again, it's just a tiny, easy move, and it's just a massive public relations success because, of course, the ink never stops spilling. She should be vice president with Trump Aruma. <laughs> Last November, the XX mailed fans invitations to European shows that had yet to be announced and then did the same thing stateside in January ahead of their latest record, I See You. In May, Animal Collective's A.V. Tear announced his new album in an unconventional way. A fan got a package from Tear's label, Domino, which is awesome, with a jigsaw puzzle inside. Once solved, it basically announced the new album, Eucalyptus, was the officially announced two weeks later. Toro E. Moi pulled a similar stunt, previewing Boo Boo via a letter sent to his fan 
fans ahead of any actual announcement or any lead singles. King Cruel's done it. Brand new, actually. Huge band. And they're just now back with their new record, Science Fiction, announced a pre-order for their very limited fifth album that was otherwise scarce on info. Two days later, select fans who had placed pre-orders received CDs of the new album in the mail. I think this speaks to a lot of what we try and do here at Media Monarchy. It should be... It should feel like that. It should have that feeling that I had as a kid when I ordered records through the mail. And I asked questions of bands or of whoever, artists. You get something back? You got a handwritten letter back? It's amazing. Even to this day when I order records from the label. You get handwritten notes. You order records from band off Bandcamp. I think it was Charlie Bliss. They sent snacks inside and said, "We love Portland." You can't beat that connection. And again, those are the connections that giant multinational corporations are spending hours of time in strategy rooms figuring out how we can act like we're authentic. And that was my battle I had at the commercial radio station. They loved me because I'm authentic. They were really excited to use my authenticity to make their crappy radio station sound a little bit better. God, I looked at the website yesterday. They've gutted that place. There's only like two of the people I ever worked with there that are still there. And it's all, of course, a bunch of funny phone calls and terrible YouTube videos. Anyway, sidebar, I don't want to go off on all that. This speaks to the authenticity of what we actually have. And I love you for that reason, too. I appreciate you. Let's continue our media memes coverage, my friends. Showtime announced on Wednesday that it acquired the rights to a rarely seen 1987 Prince concert film, Sign of the Times. The movie, written and directed by Prince as a chronicle of the tour in support of the album of the same name that was his ninth at the time. It was his double album from 1987, the year pop music achieved perfection. It will air on American TV for the first time in more than a decade on September 16th on Showtime. The Sign of the Times double album was Prince's first after disbanding the revolution, and the film features live versions of songs including You Got the Look with Sheena Easton, If I Was Your Girlfriend, I Can Never Take the Place of Your Man, as well as the title track and earlier smash Little Red Corvette. The majority of the film, which features Sheila E. on drums, was shot at Prince's Paisley Park Studios in Minnesota and on dates in the Netherlands and Belgium. Though hailed by critics at the time as a vibrant, exciting concert film on part... That's a typo, Billboard. You mean to say on par. It's a golf term. On part with such classics as the talking heads stop making sense. The 84-minute sign of the times was never issued on DVD. Shut up and take my money. I would like to watch that, so that'll be cool. Showtime acquires the rights to rare Prince sign of the times concert film. And again, say what you want about Prince. He did his own shit. He made it himself. Hey, I'm going to write and direct and shoot my own movie, and I'm going to do it at my place. It's what we all want. <laughs> Let's continue on from Billboard. Let's watch out for the typos with little leverage besides its huge customer base. Online retail behemoth Amazon is finding that disrupting the U.S. ticketing market won't be as easy as throwing its weight around. Two years ago, Amazon set out to shake up one of the few businesses it had yet to disrupt, the concert ticket industry. And this is the strange situation we find ourselves in. The bastards that even Pearl Jam couldn't take down. What, now we have to cheer Amazon because they're going to try and fuck up Ticketmaster? After first testing its proprietary ticketing technology in Europe, a more open market where customers could easily buy seats through Amazon due to the continent's lack of exclusive ticket venue contracts, the e-retailer easily sold shows for Elton John, theatrical performances for Wicked Book of Mormon. Encouraged, it began to hire a U.S. ticketing team in late 2016 with its sights set extraordinarily high. Amazon meets its match as Ticketmaster negotiations stall. Now, this is a longer article from Billboard, but I think it's just another bellwether of where we are going. And of course, that's not the last you'll hear about that. We'll continue to follow that story, as I believe I also saw the headline from yesterday saying Jeff Bezos claims that Whole Foods prices are going to get a whole lot lower. Now, I stand to lose one alcoholic beverage if indeed Floyd Mayweather knocks out Conor McGregor. 
Bookies will lose millions if McGregor knocks out Mayweather. So this is that gigantic fight that's coming up tomorrow night, Saturday night, pay-per-view style, which we've discussed this before. It's the fascinating world of boxing. It's the one thing they actually keep an amazing media stronghold on. You basically just get to see court sketches of the fight that night. It's one of the rarities and outliers in the media industrial complex. So I maybe have mentioned I, I've got my buddy Herm I used to work with at the commercial radio stations. We are complete opposites. He loves fast food and <laughs> we argue about music, we argue about politics, we are very opposite. However, now he's the only person I still keep in touch with from the radio station. You know, sometimes it's got, you know, that sort of brotherly fights that you may have, but you actually enjoy fighting with each other way more than you do with talking to anybody else. I asked him months ago, I was like, hey, so UFC guy will totally beat the shit out of boxing guy, right? And he said, no, 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 no. If it were a UFC fight, UFC fight would win. Herm says because it's a boxing match, the guy who's the boxer is going to win. So I bet him a drink. I was like, yeah, I think Whitey might take it. You heard it here, friends. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. I have one, two, three, four, five obituaries today. We'll go in order of age on down. We begin possibly with the biggest. Jerry Lewis, brash, slapstick comic who became a pop culture sensation in his partnership with Dean Martin and then transformed himself into an auteur filmmaker of such comedy classics as Nutty Professor and Bellboy, died in Las Vegas at the age of 91. We will resume our broadcast of CBS Sunday Morning shortly, but we have some breaking news to report. Jerry Lewis, who helped to define American comedy in the 20th century, has died. He was 91 years old. Carter Evans takes a look back. Jerry Lewis was born to make us laugh. He spent his youth performing in the Catskills in the clubs, perfecting a comedy shtick that would launch a lifelong career. One lucky day in 1946, he was paired with a low-key singer named Dean Martin. There's a song in the air. As he told Sunday Morning in 2016, it was bliss. I fell in love with him the day we met. Ole. Ole. It was the cool crooner and the crazy kid. The duo starred in dozens of films and TV specials before parting ways after a decade. We needed to escape one another. On his own, Lewis would go on to make more than 30 movies, writing and directing many. From the first day, I realized I got so much to learn. They couldn't get me on the set to do a scene because I was in the miniature department or the wardrobe or the camera department. I'm going to work. I got my education from film people. The adoring French gave him the Legion of Honor, but back home, critics and audiences eventually turned away. Yet even when the movies stopped, Jerry Lewis was always there. Every Labor Day for more than 40 years on the muscular dystrophy telethon. Walk on, walk on. And then there was this. We just send my friend out, please. A surprise reunion after 20 years. That was the best secret kept. All the crew, all my backstage people, everybody knew but me. Thank you so much. But while he was admired by many, he was vilified by others who said he demeaned the disabled by pitying them. But he never apologized. Instead, he raised nearly $2 billion for the charity. Jerry Lewis had his own health problems, cancer, heart, and lung disease. But through it all, he kept performing, even into his 90s. Like my daughter said, Dad, would you have liked not to make 90? I said, no, I'm very happy about it. Jerry Lewis, forever a kid. Hi, my name is Norman, and I'm nine. And an American king of comedy. I've got the pictures in my head of the audiences. And I just see them laughing. Carter Evans, CBS News, Hollywood. Comedy legend Jerry Lewis, dead at 91. Hoyven Maven. Yeah, that's what Frank is on The Simpsons. His, his reach and influence is boundless. Now, two things I would just mention in closing about Jerry, Le J Jerry Lewis. 
If you've never seen Martin Scorsese's, one of his lesser known from the 80s films called The King of Comedy, holy moly, I highly recommend it. Robert De Niro is a crazy person who kidnaps Jerry Lewis, who's playing a fictional version of himself. It's also got Sandra Bernhard. It's insane. Now, the other bit, and Swag's already been tweeting about it. She was basically the one I first heard that probably Jerry Lewis died with Swagger Prince's tweet that says, Can we finally see the day the clown cried now, please? Apparently, Jerry Lewis made a Holocaust comedy called The Day the Clown Cried, which, you know, Roberto Benigni from Italy would be able to pull off successfully decades later with Life is Beautiful. Apparently, Jerry Lewis made a Holocaust comedy that didn't turn out so well, and no one's ever seen it. It's never been released. Apparently, there are like four copies. Some people have seen it. I think Harry Shearer might have one. Wired several years ago had an issue where they basically went over sort of the pop culture ephemera that have been lost or kind of lost, like that awful Star Wars holiday special. Another obituary, he was the king of TV, the prince of performers. Stars of stage and screen pay their tribute to Sir Bruce Forsyth. As the beloved entertainer dies at the age of 89, surrounded by his wife and children, one of the biggest stars of British show business. Died at the age of 89, legendary broadcaster and entertainer, considered a national treasure by fans, former colleagues, and stars of stage and screen alike. He did Strictly Come Dancing and a million other BBC, sh BBC shows. It's one I'll admit I'm not too familiar with. Another I'm not too familiar with, and that's why I do these shows. It's educational for me. Mike Hennessy, one of the great personalities of the global music market and a longtime editor at Billboard, died last Wednesday in Germany at the age of 89. After a brief illness, he was internationally celebrated pianist for well-known jazz ensembles. He wrote bios for Kenny Clark, Johnny Griffin, Ronnie Scott. Worked for Billboard for 27 years, and the picture on Billboard has him with John and Yoko. Obituary number four, Dick Gregory, comedian and activist who broke racial barriers in the 1960s and used his humor to spread the message of social justice and nutritional health, has died at the age of 84. Now to the passing of a comedic legend and civil rights activist. Dick Gregory has died. CBS News' Christy Fajardo is live in Hollywood at Gregory Star on the Walk of Fame with more on his life and his legacy. Christy. Yes, Serene, Dick Gregory's talent and his fame earned him this star here on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. But tonight, his contributions to the civil rights movement are also being remembered. My brother called me. They're about to repossess my car. What must I do? Don't park in front of the house. <laughs> That was Dick Gregory in a 2009 TV special, but he became famous decades earlier in the early 1960s, satirizing segregation and racism. He was one of the first African-American comics to play white nightclubs. He began his career in the Army, but got his big break in 1961 when Hugh Hefner booked him at the Playboy Club. He was also the first black comedian to sit on the couch on The Tonight Show and later used his celebrity to champion desegregation and equality, trading stand-up for sit-ins at civil rights rallies and stayed active in politics over the years. Tonight, words honoring his legacy are pouring in on Twitter. Singer John Legend writes, Dick Gregory's, Gregory led an amazing revolutionary life, a groundbreaker in comedy and a voice for justice. The Reverend Jesse Jackson tweeted, he taught us how to laugh, he taught us how to fight, he taught us how to live. Dick Gregory was committed to justice. I miss him already. And Whoopi Goldberg had this to say, tweeting, about being black in America, Dick Gregory has passed away. Condolences to his family and to us who won't have his insight to lean on. Now back out here live, Dick Gregory died in a hospital in Washington, D.C. He was 84 years old. He is survived by his wife and 10 children and legions of fans who are mourning him tonight. Back to you. Tweeted by Jesse Jackson, MLK assassination conspirator. Now, I think actually the last time we heard from Dick Gregory on this show, it was probably last summer as America's Next Top President was heating up and we played a clip of Dick Gregory saying there are two Trumps. There's the red tie Trump and the blue tie Trump and they're different and they have different personalities and styles. Our fifth and final obituary, Jay Thomas, radio talk show host and actor with recurring roles on Murphy Brown and Cheers, has died at the age of 69. Thomas's best-known roles were Eddie Lebeck, former hockey player turned husband of barmaid Carla on Cheers, and tabloid talk show host Jerry Gold on Murphy Brown, for which he won two Emmys. That's a lot of RIPs. Now, let's start to wrap up this episode. Holy moly, I still got a lot of headlines, so I'm going to have to blast through them. 
25,000 plus 78 RPM records now professionally digitized and streaming online. It is a treasure trove of early 20th century music. You may have heard me recently talking about the book I'm reading right now. I'm loving Do Not Sell at Any Price, the wild obsessive hunt, hunt for the world's most rare records. The Great 78 Project, it's called. And you can find that just like you can find all kinds of other awesome stuff on openculture.com. Interesting bit of research. It's long. I have not dived into it by any stretch. A statistical analysis of the relationship between harmonic surprise and preference in popular music. I believe this might get into the elements that, you know, it's a little bit of a split. We don't really like to be surprised by music. We like to sort of expect and think we know what's about to come. It's the same thing for all our favorite artists. Our favorite bands and artists, we would all mostly be fine if they essentially kept doing what they did, just with little slight variations. And with that, I will announce to you, rock icon Morrissey will release his first album in three years and new label distribution announced Tuesday, promising that the work will offer fresh political insights from the outspoken singer. I'm not loving the album title. Low in High School. Low in High School, the 11th studio solo album from the British artist whose morose, sardonic lyricism is one of an impassioned fan base, will come out November 17th. Now, here's the good news, my friends. This is what's super awesome, super exciting. For Low in High School, Morrissey launched his own label, Etienne, the French form of Stephen, his first name. Etienne will be distrued distributed by BMG, a unit of German media giant Bertelsmann. Formerly a major label, BMG relaunched in 2008 with a focus on music publishing and distribution. They said it was a dream to sign Morrissey. Quicksand have announced their first album in 22 years, Punk Rock Legends. I'm sure we'll hear from that. They're actually not sharing any songs yet, just little snippets of sounds from like a teaser trailer. We interviewed our new buddy Andy Widows at Andy Has Bad Taste several months back about the latest Kendrick Lamar record, and we talked for a good half hour about how it is a dense story. We're not sure if it's meant to be played backwards or forwards, or there's just a lot. Well, wonder no more. Kendrick Lamar confirms Damn is meant to be played backwards. We published that during our vacation, our conversation uh, titled, What is this damn album about? A hilarious bit, a bunch of tracks from Queens of the Stone Age new album Villains were accidentally pressed to another release, which we'll always get a kick out of, which brings us to New Music Friday. It is new release day, and that new Queens of the Stone Age record comes out. It's actually on Matador. It's called Villains. New War on Drugs comes out today. A deeper understanding. There's new Iron and Wine, new OCs. Lily Hyatt's record Trinity Lane comes out. We played that song the night David Bowie died. Pretty impressive. Flamin' Groovies return after a 24-year layoff with Fantastic Plastic. Suzanne Sunfor has her own record. She sang with M83 on the Oblivion soundtrack. There's new music from The Fresh and Onlys. I saw them open for Sloan. Who else we got? A Giant Dog out of Texas. Mark Olson from Jayhawks. He's got a solo record out today. Tobacco from Black Moth Super Rainbow. We played a track of his earlier in the week. That record comes out today, and you can find all that and everything else we've just talked about in the previous 48 minutes in our show notes, my friends. We're going to go out with brand spanking new music. I think it's only 24 hours old from a crazy little Scientologist named Beck Hansen. But first, my friends, let's look at this date in history. August 25th, 1835. Fake news ain't new. The first Great Moon Hoax article is published in the New York Sun, announcing the discovery and life and civilization on the moon. That was run this day in the New York Sun in 1835. August 25th, 1916, the United States National Park Service was created on this day. 1948, the House Un-American Activities Committee holds first ever televised congressional hearing, and it was Confrontation Day between Whitaker Chambers and Alger Hiss. August 25th, 1950, President Harry Truman orders the U.S. Army to seize control of the nation's railroads, you know, to avert a strike. Thanks, government. August 25th, 1960, George Lincoln Rockwell, founder of the American Nazi Party, is assassinated by former member of the American Nazi Party. It's always an inside job. August 25th, 1975, Bruce Springsteen's Born to Run was released on this day in, 1990, in 1988, rather. And Justice for All came out from Metallica. August 25th, 1993, 22-year-old Philip Waldemarium 
was shot in Los Angeles, and Snoop Doggy Dog was charged with first-degree murder as an accomplice. Dog's bodyguard, McKinley Lee, was charged with first-degree murder. Lee and Dog said the shooting was in self-defense, Dog. August 25th, 1994. Jimmy Buffett's plane flips after taking off in Nantucket, Massachusetts. He swims to safety. However, that same day, seven years later, 16 years ago today, August 25th, 2001, in the Bahamas, Aaliyah and eight others are killed when their plane crashed in Marsh Harbor in the Abacos Islands off the northern Bahamas. The cause appeared to be engine failure due to the plane being overloaded. Aaliyah killed on this day. Two big stories tonight. Singer actress Aaliyah is killed in a plane crash. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. A breaking story out of the Bahamas tonight. Authorities have confirmed that R&B singer and actress Aaliyah is among eight people killed in a plane crash. Yeah, the plane crashed as it tried to take off from the island of Abaco in the Bahamas. Nine people, all Americans, were on board that plane. One man survived the crash and was taken to a nearby hospital. The plane was leaving Marsh Harbor Airport around 3.50 local time when it went down. Aaliyah and her crew had been shooting a video in the Bahamas. The plane was taking the group back to the United States when it crashed. CNN is reporting that baggage handlers said the plane was overloaded with suitcases and that the handlers and the plane's pilot complained about the heavy load. But they say passengers insisted on taking everything with them. Aaliyah was recently nominated for a Grammy Award for her song Try Again and made her acting debut in the movie movie Romeo Must Die. We'll have more on this breaking story as it develops. Holy noise floor, Batman. That is probably a VHS rip, and that's a compilation of Aaliyah clips that are up online, and even as you hear it, I mean, seven other John Does that don't get their names mentioned, but it basically sounds like, oh, my entourage, they need to bring all their shit on board. Gotta watch out for too much entourage. Hey, Frank, I'm almost done. This is the point where Frankie comes in and is like, are you done with the yap yap yet? Last bit of this day in history, August 25th, 2012, Voyager 1, which was pretty much launched as I was born in August of 77. Voyager 1 spacecraft today in 2012 entered interstellar space, becoming the first man-made object to do so. That's how we're making a soundtrack for another planet to hear. Published to my own website a decade ago, CNN host shocked when Republican guest picks Ron Paul. That was published to Media Monarchy one decade ago today, August 25th, 20, 2007, and one I actually missed yesterday, unfortunately. Sometimes trying to put so much news on the stack that some few things slip through here and there. It was actually published on August 24th. That was the day it was announced. Aaron Russo died a decade ago. Aaron Russo, producer of America from Freedom to Fascism, passed away August 24th, 2007. Great American hero and patriot. He had fast-acting cancer that suddenly knocked him out the minute he tried to start talking about truth topics. Holy moly, the birthdays today. Sometimes the lists of birthdays are just really interesting. As we talked yesterday, it's always the interesting syncs and synchronicities and bits. What did we have yet? What did we call it? Technology astrology yesterday with Windows 95, the Gutenberg Bible, and something else. Yeah, somebody already knows it in the chat. <laughs> somebody already knows one of the big birthdays today on August 25th, but let's head down the list. August 25th, 1530, Russian ruler Ivan the Terrible. Born on this day in 1530. 1819, Alan Pinkerton. That's the Scottish-American detective and spy who would give us the murderous Pinkerton agency. Ruby Keeler, actress, singer, dancer, born on this day. Walt Kelly, American illustrator and animator, creator of the legendary comic strip Pogo. If you've not read that, you must. Mel Farrar, born on this day. Leonard Bernstein, Sean Connery, Wayne Shorter, Tom Skerritt, John Batta, Marshall Brickman. He co-wrote a lot of the early Woody Allen movies. The man, the myth, the mustache, Raleigh Fingers, born on this day. It's also actor John Savage's birthday, which I didn't quite realize. He's the guy who steps on dude's shoes and do the right thing. Whoa, 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 whoa. He's wearing the Celtics jersey. Celtics jersey, if you like. On down the birthday list. 
<laughs> sometimes called the ugliest man alive, and he thinks he came up with the devil horns. Gene Simmons, Israeli-American singer, songwriter, producer, and actor, born on this day in 1949. It's also Rob Halford's birthday from Judas Priest, and it is, yes, head in a jar, you are right, Declan McManus's birthday. That's right, Elvis Costello, born on this day. It's also Tim Burton's birthday, Billy Ray Cyrus, Vivian Campbell from Def Leppard. I just got to see him a couple months ago. Shock G from Digital Underground. He's the Humpty. Blair Underwood, Joanne Wally, Terminator X from Public Enemy, Jeff Tweedy from Wilco, Stuart Murdoch from Bell and Sebastian, Spider One from Power Man 5000, Rachel Ray, Jody Messina, Claudia Schiffer, and Alexander Skarsgård. All those folks celebrating birthdays today. I think that probably means I'll have to start your daily DJ set at noon with some Elvis Costello. I do have a, a little bit of Elvis Costello on vinyl, but actually, even when I went into the weed store yesterday, they were playing Beck on the system. And I said, oh, hey, Beck put out a new song today, and it's crickets, blink. Human interaction is difficult sometimes. That's why I like hanging out with you here at Media Monarchy, where I, you pretty much know what I'm talking about. Brand new music from Beck came out yesterday. The song is called Dear Life. And it's on his new upcoming LP just announced called Colors. It's coming out on October 13th. Yeah, we have, yeah, we've moved out of Leo. We are into Virgo. And I haven't mentioned Mercury is in retrograde. That might be causing some monkey wrench action as well. Sidebar. Beck is also here in Portland this weekend. There's the big Project Pabst Music Fest that happens this weekend. It's actually Iggy Pop and DeAntward and Beck and Nas and Spoon and actually White Reaper and Lizzo and all kinds of artists. So little Beck will be coming to town here in just about 24, 48 hours. And as we will play brand new music for Beck for you, Dear Life. As we wrap up another week of your Morning Monarchies, my friends. Again, I'll be under the hood working on some of the tech issues that are going on with the feed. If you're having issues, of course, please reach out to me, James, at MediaMonarchy.com. It seems like it's a lot of Apple issues. And again, just try, right-click, save as, and I'll post the stuff up on YouTube as well. You can always hear the stream live, MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. A huge thanks to our simulcasters at RadioConfluence.com, and a huge thanks to you for keeping us moving and grooving. MediaMonarchy.com slash support. The PayPal, the Patreon, the Bitcoin, the post office box. If you can give a little, I can give a lot. And that's the Media Memes edition of Your Morning Monarchy for Friday, August 25th, 2017. I am James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. Thank you so much for listening, y'all. Reminding you, as always, like Jello B. Offer says, don't hate the media, become the media. Take care. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology, and the occult. All remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.